Welcome everyone to this uh, session on building partnerships for sustainable systems. My name is Anna Torsheng, working at the HISP Center in the implementation group. So in this session, we will address the issue of coordination of DHIS2 investments and plans, what countries can do, what donors can do to support countries in the best possible way. So many countries are facing the challenges of funding core HMIS operations. We know that either because of lack of funding or at the expense of attempts to try to uh, introduce uh, exceedingly advanced systems at the expense of, um, of the core HMIS. Most countries using DHIS2, they implement through uh, with the support of various partners, sometimes coordinated, sometimes not. And today we wish to discuss how we can best support this. This potentially can also lead to fragmented systems, not speaking to each other, it could lead to lack of attention to the core building blocks of DHIS2 implementation, such as infrastructure, governance, master facility lists, capacity building, issues we know are important to keep systems running over time, and also lack of long-term financial support and limited attention to sustainable implementations that last beyond pilot periods. Did it change? Yes. Here is a picture of a typical DHIS2 implementation. On top, this pretty house, often it rests on a bit of a shaky foundation of things we all know needs to be in place for a system to not fall over after a few months or years. Quite often we see that uh, partners are interested in funding the pretty house on top and not necessarily the pillars that it rests on. It can cause a bit of challenges down the line. So examples of things that needs investment and attention over time are typically are the facility lists um, correctly represented in DHIS2. Is there a system for end user support who will pick up the phone when your nurse at facility X has trouble logging in? Is someone paying her salary? Is access control managed well? Uh, are there available DHIS2 skills in the country? to mention a few, um, a few issues. The HISP Center and with collaboration of the whole HISP network has published a framework that we call the DHIS2 maturity profile. Uh, that is uh, a, a questionnaire basically addressing a lot of these foundational issues to have sustainable DHIS2 systems. It identifies uh, weak and strong aspects of a DHIS2 implementation in country, and it can help to identify smart domains to strengthen in order for your system to stay alive for a long time. Additionally, it can serve as a guide to determine readiness for new projects. So if your oh my God, I forgot to change the slides. So if your foundation here is weak, it could be how the country is training end users. Uh, do they have routines, tools, processes in place for security, for example, for keeping uh, metadata and org units in the DHIS2 system, DHIS2 system um, clean and tidy, to mention a few. If that is not in place, then maybe it's not the time to start a very advanced uh, national scale tracker program that hits thousands and thousands of facilities. So it's really about building piece by piece in a systematic way. So we have currently about 50 countries through the HISP groups that have conducted this DHIS2 maturity uh, profile um, assessment. It's done in collaboration with the ministries. So HISP groups and ministries uh, together uh, are doing these assessments. And we write reports outlining the current situation of the country, what their priorities are for the coming few years, and some suggested next steps uh, to take. And this can be used as a tool to communicate between donors uh, within the ministry itself, etc. You can access these reports by writing to this email address or just Google uh, DHIS2 maturity profile. We have it on our website, more information about it, access to the tool, etc. We really encourage people who are working with DHIS2 in a country to read these reports. It can be very um, useful when uh, planning your implementations. Today, you will hear from um, several very exciting speakers who uh, can enlighten different aspects of this uh, topic. 
We will have uh, some uh, people speaking first, and then we will have a panel discussion afterwards. And we really hope that it can also be a little bit interactive with questions from the audience. First, you will hear from Dr. Steve McFeely from the WHO. He is the Director of Data and Analytics at WHO headquarters. He will talk about the WHO uh, perspective on this, what WHO can do to support countries. We have uh, Mr. Hassan from Somalia. He is the lead of the HMIS team at the Ministry of Health. Sitting over here, he will have a short uh, presentation with Somalia's perspective on the issue of coordination. We have Dr. Kediende Chong uh, sitting here. He is the Director General for Preventive Health Services and an Emergency Response. And he also has a background previously leading the Policy Planning and Monitoring Evaluation and Research Unit at the Ministry of Health in South Sudan. And I think many of you heard him in the plenary session on Tuesday. Uh, at least I thought personally it was very, very interesting to hear his perspectives. In the panel afterwards, we also have Maria Muniz from UNICEF. She's Senior Advisor Statistics and Monitoring at UNICEF Data and Analytics. We have Prosper Behumbisa with a perspective from the HISP group. He is from HISP Uganda, Director of Programs and a DHIS2 Implementation Advisor, very experienced one. And to lead us through this panel discussion, we have uh, Sam Johnson-Scott from the GFF and the World Bank. He's a results specialist there. So I think this will be a very interesting session with uh, good presentations coming from both countries and partners. Thank you. We will now give the word to um, Dr. Steve McFeely from WHO. Looking forward to hear your presentation. Thanks, Anne. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, apologies for not being there in person. I very much wish I could be in Oslo, um, but I'm at my desk in Geneva, so I'm joining you in spirit. So let me get the most stressful part of the day over, and that's hopefully sharing my screen. Okay, so can I confirm that you can see my screen in presentation mode? Yes, we see it. Okay, so thank you. So I, I wanna make a few kind of general opening remarks that really build on what Anne was just saying, and I hope will resonate with everybody who's gonna speak afterwards. So in a way, I want to focus on the word in interoperability, because I think that maybe is the word that cuts across everything we're talking about. So it's really about the ability to work together and more importantly, to get systems to work together. How do we get data um, to work together, to communicate with each other? Th the main point I would like to make just on this slide is, I think building on what Anne said, I think this is often misdiagnosed as an IT issue. Digital and IT will do a certain amount for us. But if we look at this from a digital perspective only, I, th I think we're really making a mistake. So in addition to that, I would argue that we need good data ar ar uh, infrastructure, good data architecture, and good data governance. And I'll speak a bit about those in a moment. And I would also make the point that when we're trying to change systems, th this is not a short-term project. It, what we're talking about here is long-term investment, long-term projects. So this is really about changing culture. It's about management and leadership as much as technical issues. And I think those, those elements are often um, overlooked when, when we talk about things that we need to be doing. So there's some definitions just here of interoperability. And as I said, it's all about connecting um, heterogeneous systems. And I think that's very much uh, what we face in, in the health sector. And the best, I, I often see people talking about Lego um, as the example, but from Le Lego was built intentionally to be interconnected uh, and that's not the reality that we face so I actually think a better analogy is container traffic uh, in particular multimodal con container traffic that had to be adapted and all of the transport systems had to be adapted so that we can move containers from a ship to a truck um, and, on, and onto a train and I, I think that's probably more what we're facing is a number of heterogeneous systems that work independently, but we have to find a way to move the container or the packages of information between those different modes. 
but it can be done and we've seen that uh, as i said with container traffic so i think that's a very good example and inspiration just a quick word on health information systems so that th th this is taken from a, a who report and it divides information into population-based um, information and institution-based. When I was putting together these slides, I was thinking, actually, we probably need at this stage to add machine-based, um, at least from my perspective. I think there's a lot of information now trapped in, in technological systems, whether it's um, scanners um, or other types of information. So I think we need to broaden the, the definition here to machine-based. Um, and what we're really trying to do is figure out how do we get these different packages of information across all of these different systems to talk to each other. Um, and in, in thinking about that, then Anne won't be surprised by what I'm going to say next. The, we, all, we often talk about health information systems, but I, I think a better frame of mind is to talk about information systems for health. And the reason I say that because health doesn't exist in a bubble. It's, it's interconnected both as a determinant and as an outcome of economy, of the wider society and of our environment. So an awful lot of the determinants of health don't happen in health. They happen uh, because of environmental issues, societal issues, and equally the impacts or the outcomes of, of, of poor health or good health, they spill out and um, they, they're not trapped in the health sector. Um, and we saw this, I mean, a classic example is during COVID, we, we saw a health issue spilling out and really impacting on the economy and society where we had to shut down things. So th those spillovers exist all the time. They're, done, they're perhaps not always as obvious, um, but they do exist. So it's not enough to connect pieces of information within the health sector. We also need to be able to connect to education, uh, to tax data, to environmental data, to understand what's driving health outcomes, but then also to understand what are those health, health outcomes. Because from a public health perspective, it, it's not just about tweaking things in a hospital. It, it's, it's a much broader issue. And I think sometimes we lose sight of that when we talk about health information systems. So what I quickly want to show you here, that this is a paper myself and a, a, a former colleague published back in 2017. And we had written this at the kind of the outset of the SDGs, but it was really focusing on what you might call the prerequisites or the preconditions um, for putting in place good systems. And I think you, you, we, we can adjust this very easily to a health information system. Um, so if I start at the top with what, what, what I'm now calling data governance in, in the paper, we'd call it legislative systems because there is a sequence to this. And I would start by saying data governance is very important. So things like confidentiality, sorting out legal access to primary and secondary data, and also making sure that there's professional independence um, for the people who are doing the analysis. These are really, really important and they just can't be overstated. And um, this is where the, the frameworks for data quality and such happen, because without this, we're just going to create other problems. So we need, we really need to sort out the, the policy and the legal dimensions. Then if we swing down to the, the orange hexagon, data infrastructures. So this is about the, the pieces of infrastructure that we need, but specifically data infrastructure. So I'm not talking about technology here. What I'm talking about is things like classifications, unique identifiers, all of the things that we need to move data from one place to another, to be able to share data that we're now legally allowed, allowed to do, but now we need the pieces. And broadly speaking, I, th I think you can break this down into three things. So the first is the health facilities themselves. Where are they physically? So th this is more like the XY type of, or GIS component. Then we need the, the businesses. So this would be the health facilities, but all other businesses as well uh, that interact with the health sector. What's, what's their unique identifier? So how do we connect hospital data with, with pharmacy data, maybe with insurance data, and then the people and the patients. So we, we, we want to have some sort of a unique identifier so that we can track people over time. 
so that we can then again connect outcomes so we can see if we link it to educational data does educational attainment or um, does that have impacts on people's outcomes over time does people uh, do, do their incomes have, have uh, impacts over time and so forth it allows us to do a lot more rich analysis um, than, than anything that we can do really at the moment and then perhaps the most important in some ways because it's usually overlooked and this is the institutional coordination so this really what we're talking about here is coordinating between ourselves statistical experts specialist experts geographic experts you could reframe this as well as national experts and international experts you could look at this in all sorts of ways and why I say this is the most important, in some ways it is because, like I said, it's often the least considered and the piece that people tend to pay less attention to. Because as I said at the start, developing a health information system, it's not a one or two year project. You're probably, if you're really talking about developing a, a system that's fit for purpose, you're probably talking minimum of 10 years. And that can be challenging for donors because it's a very long timeline. So the tendency always is to focus on, on short term, on, on getting quick wins. And international organizations are no exception to this. They, they tend to look at things through a prism of, of short wins as well. And it's unfortunate because I think really countries need time to develop these systems. Because as I mentioned at the start, the cultural dimension is hugely important, not just the technical. And, and it's one of the, just to kind of say, it's one of the things I've admired about the DHS2 kind of program is it's a technical solution but it's married to a much broader cultural um, evolution where you're, you're you're building phd graduates they're returning home and and that marriage i, I think is very very important and th th this is why i think this this piece um is, is super super important so with that and um, i will stop here thank you Wonderful. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, with that, I'll welcome um, Mr. Hassan from the Ministry of Health Somalia to talk about their approaches to coordinating DHIS2 investments. Thank you. Good morning to all of you. I hope you can hear me, right? Thanks. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, thank you again. I would like to give you a brief presentation about the Somalia health information system journey and with the, especially with the focus on the coordination and also the alignment of resources to the health information system uh, with the respect of the strategic, strategic documents that the government has already uh, developed. And uh, a bit background, the Minister of Health is committed to strengthening the health information system at all levels of the government, starting from the facility level up to national level, the central government. And Somalia, the DH2 system has been established and most of the facilities are linked to the DH2 system. And we also have a staff trained in the DH2 system at, the, at, the, at, the, at any level, from, from the national level to, to the facility level. And there is a substantial government buy-in to, to Somalia, DH2 system and ownership of the system, uh, where the facility level, even you can uh, see uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the guidance of the, of, the, of the health information system, they feel that the, they own the system uh, when it comes to the facility level. So within the Minister of Health, and in collaboration with our partners, the health management information system is crucial for the for the efficient and effective operation of our health programs in in several ways, like the, with the respect of data collection, data management, data planning, and also the review uh, programs for for the review planning and, and implementation. And uh, some initial data use systems are in place, uh, specifically uh, weekly epidemiological data collection. Uh, monthly health uh, data center and hospital reports, 
And in some areas, there are also regional coordination meetings where data are reviewed on quarterly basis. And the, the DH2 and, LMI and HMIS information tools are, and indicators are updated in Somalia every three years to address any data gap with the support of um, an inclusive consultation from the Somalia's development partners. The, the HMI Somalia is currently transitioning from a, a fragmented phase to an integrated phase, uh, looking back to three years ago, where we are. And this is the progressive step in Somalia's integration journey to avoid uh, system uh, fragmentation. The MOH conducted and led the DH2 revision to ensure that the data elements and indicators were updated and relevant to the country needs to allow the monitoring of all health and nutrition uh, programs within one system. And this is, was uh, three years ago, and uh, it was conducted via uh, consult inclusive consultative process with MOH inviting and including all program colleagues, UN partners and stakeholders to come up with a unified standard indicators to all programs. And we addressed all programmatic data gaps, uh, including uh, in particular EPI, malaria, HIV, TB. And we successfully integrated the community health, nutrition, and, and IDSR into a single platform, the, the DH2 system. And the, the reform is particularly important as it will allow access, analysis, comparison of health, nutrition, community health, and communicable disease data in, an, in a single platform. In addition to that, the DH2 is also accommodating and aggregate LMIs and also the human resource module, which will support, as now is currently supporting supply management and forecasting at the facility level, and also the HR management and information uh, on staff training until the LMIs and EHR become uh, available uh, in the country. And this is the essential guiding principle we used in order to achieve uh, full integration uh, it was a collab collaborative process led by the government, and it, and we also prioritized the services and the reporting currently being implemented. And we also the focus was the marginalized group. Also, we looked at the gender, socioeconomic uh, indicators, and it it all it was also by the driven um, by data and based on evidence based uh, the, the, the the guiding principle. And um, we have also avoid the dupl any duplication. Uh, we, we addressed any uh, data, data gap uh, with regard to, to, to the specific program. So we, we invited all partners into one table so that uh, we can avoid any duplication or maybe any necessary uh, creation of uh, parallel systems in the country. In this way, we also using this essential guiding principle, we, we managed to minimize any new systems or structures in place uh, at the country. And the objective of integration uh, we have in, in Somalia is to increase availability of data into one integrated platform to strengthen reliability and, and also the quality of routine and case-based uh, health management information system within uh, one platform. And also ensure regular data use for health services improvement and effectively use the resources finance government uh, to uh, priorities and fill, fill the gaps. And this is uh, the Somalia also um, launched uh, a year ago, uh, Agile's alignment strategy. Uh, it, it was also overall um, alignment strategy that uh, the uh, all the components of the health services to align the, the, the limited resources we have. So Agile is one, one of the components that uh, we also strategically aligned with the, the government priorities. And uh, we, we, we have aligned the surveys. So we have a lot of different surveys, health assessments conducted in the country. And we, say, we, 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 say, we, we sat together with all partners and come up with uh, alignment uh, procedure that we align surveys, which indicators are we monitoring, and also the frequency and scope of the surveys. And we also aligned the HMIS indicators monitoring and areas of HMIS support. For example, uh, the registers, if we have uh, maybe uh, a project running in different areas, uh, we 
uh, the, 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 we make sure that the registers are printed uh, those organizations, not duplicated to, to any other resources. The same similar equipment, the quality of data, and also we align the TAs, the capacity building uh, investment in the country. We also align the data use uh, to, to have only one uh, analytics to, to, to program, the admission program. And we also aligned and established effective health management information coordination structure that the government leads. So this is uh, an area, a platform where we bring together all partners uh, to, um, to, 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 to discuss and also align investments to, to the health management information system. This is also a platform where we present our priorities and also align all the investments and resources. This is the alignment strategy for surveys and assessments. This is what we are aligning, uh, combining planet surveys, uh, expanding geographic scope uh, to have only one survey instead of conducting uh, different uh, surveys with the limited resources we have. And also this is the HMIS alignment strategy, align indicators monitored, harmonize support for HMIS functional areas, and also align geographic support, harmonize support for, for updates. And this is uh, the TAs, the technical assistance capacities, uh, capacity buildings we align. We, we align positions uh, supported by the different NGOs or maybe donors, harmonize technical assistances and also align uh, training is in order to avoid any duplication might happen uh, in the same geographical area. And this is the with the respect of alignment of the strategic the data use to have only one shared analytics to measure progress, joint review meeting with all stakeholders to review together uh, the, the programmatic aspect, common data use to have only one dashboard bulletin reporting quarterly, and this is the next step for the HMI Somalia's improvement team. We are planning to effectively utilize, utilize the health information system resources uh, to finance the government priorities and, and address data gaps. And to, to improve coordination among HMI's partners and the government, this is the platform we can, uh, we can effectively coordinate uh, all the resources to have HMI's platform uh, where you can bring all partners together in, in, in one platform. So we also encourage regular data use for health service improvement, uh, conduct the HIS partner mapping exercise within the technical working group. So this will also facilitate uh, the, the, the resources available and, uh, and also the areas of strength and areas of weakness to, uh, to invest more. And engage partners supporting health service provision and counter to extend the digitalization of electronic health record. And also we are planning uh, to develop an interoperability framework to guide HMI support innovation solutions. So there are a lot of innovation, innovation is coming to the health facility to replace the ex existing tools, the register. So we should have an uh, interoperability framework that guides um, one electronic medical record at the facility level. Uh, which also uh, interoperable with the current health management information system at the national level. And this is some of the challenges we have, interoperability issue, resource constraints we have, uh, but we are coordinating now with the HIS technical working group and the skilled uh, workforce uh, to have HIS core team at the national, at the district level. It's very important. Infrastructure limitation is also um, a key challenge we have and also the private sector participation. Uh, we have a lot of private uh, health clinics at the country and the private sector account is 48% when it comes to the health provision to the community. So if you don't, if you are not able to accommodate the, the, the private data within the health management information system, so you, your data is not representative to entire country. So it is very important uh, we also uh, accommodate and also tackle this challenge. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Hassan from Somalia MOH. I think that was uh, very impressive. A lot of the initiatives you have ongoing. Thank you so much. Uh, next, I will call on uh, Dr. Kedi and Chong from Ministry of Health, uh, South Sudan.
Good morning, everyone. Yeah, I'm Kidian De Chong, the Director General for Preventive Health Services in the Ministry of Health, Republic of South Sudan. But previously, I was also the Director General in charge of policy planning, uh, research, monitoring, and evaluation in the Republic of South Sudan, Ministry of Health. Uh, I'm here to share with you from South Sudan perspective, what does it mean to build partnerships for sustainable uh, systems? Uh, I would not go much, I want to say much as this is a familiar slide with some of the participants here, it's about the background. We always remind ourselves that we are older than our own country, and, and, and that is, is, is unique. So we also promise the world to begin where the world is. And uh, we make sure that we don't move backwards, we move forward with them. Uh, we, from 2018, we started the DHIS 2 and it's rolled out across all the counties in the states. And uh, that is to assist the implementation and development of strategies for the national health policy and our strategic plan. We have a national health policy that runs for 10 years. The first phase of the five years was completed and currently we are running the last phase of the 10 years with a new strategic plan. And here is the, the, the strategic framework that we have in that strategic plan, which outlines clearly our vision, as well as the mission and, and of course the goal and all the strategic objectives and the specific objectives with the program areas. I will not go, much, go through all that, but one more important thing we wanted to say or to talk about here uh, we all believe in, in partnerships and it's part of, 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 of our strategic objective. If you see, uh, we have a clear strategic objective on, 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 on partnerships. So uh, for us to be able to deliver health, to be able to have a sustainable system, we believe we can't do it without uh, uh, support of our partners. Uh, but... This has proved to be very more, very challenging and is getting more challenging every day. And here is just a snapshot of some of the challenges that we have been facing in putting into, in, in place a, 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 a robust uh, system for health information, data collection, you know, analysis, data use in the country. So if you can see uh, South Sudan, uh, unfortunately, is 90% depending on the partners to deliver its health services to the population. And, and, and this donor dependency is, however, creating uh, not only uh, non-alignment of the, of, the, of, of, of the priorities, but there is always a tendency to set up own structures and operate parallel uh, reporting systems, which is clearly at the expenses of the national systems. And this has resulted in so many things, including insufficient uh, support to, this, uh, to, to, to strengthen the health management information system, and as well, the performance monitoring structures at all levels are not adequately supported. As well, uh, we also have insufficient, there is also insufficient use of HMIS guidelines, which are clearly uh, developed based on the framework documents that we, we have and, and, and all the manuals, including the SOPs, the procedures for recording, reporting, data quality checks, information use, and the indicator list. It has also resulted in parallel reporting system, which we have shown, and I will also show you in the next slide, we have been having more than eight parallel reporting systems in the country with many different tools for reporting. Uh, that includes the forms, and the forms are actually also very becoming, you know, uh, increasingly uh, printed by the, the, the partners uh, without any, any proper coordination. 
There is also an inadequate number of skilled staff with a frequent turnover and uh, at all levels, and that is due to poor remuneration, as well as uh, uh, lack of, of, of capacity to retain the staff at the MOH, and therefore the resources that are being provided through the funding mechanisms are draining the, the staff from, from the national system. Insufficient mechanisms for data quality check at the facility level, and of course this results in low reporting. And here, uh, just to give an example, uh, depending on the funding mechanism, if a funding mechanism supports the facility, supports the staff, there is always, you know, uh, a, a tendency to 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 name the facility or to add the name of the of the partner or the name of the of the, of, the, of the project to the facility name, and and the same facility will appear in the master list uh, once or twice or even three times, looking as if there are three different facilities. And this directly affects the reporting uh, status or the reporting rate because the denominator here actually increases unnecessarily, which, which affects the reporting rate. Uh, we also, as a country, we have had our census only in 2008 and, going, and, and actually from that time until today, we have been using population estimates, which also affects our, our, our plans in a way. Uh, and also a good number of, in, of funding mechanisms have been resisting, supporting, providing support for any population-based survey, given the context. Uh, we also have the limited capacity in using the electronic data collection at the lower level facilities, where there are also issues to do with the infrastructure, as well as, 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 as the, the, the technical uh, capacity in terms of literal, uh, digital literacy. We also have inadequate capacity for data analysis at, at, at all levels. Here is the overview of what our health uh, management information system has been looking like. And, and it's quite chaotic. And we have tried our best to talk to our partners and try to, 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 to improve on this. I'm happy to indicate that a good number of partners have clearly responded. And we have tried to, to, to integrate a good number of these. And we are also in the process of transitioning out in some of the, of, from some of those parallel systems. A good example is actually WHO. WHO has been using EWAS for emergency reporting. And now we are actually in the process of transitioning into the EIDSR using the DHIS2. We have also uh, transitioned out from the use of ODK and uh, especially for vaccination uh, when COVID was being, 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 being reported and we shifted already to use the DHIS2. Uh, and we also uh, are working towards transitioning out from other funding, other uh, reporting mechanisms. The, the, the biggest challenge is some partners would still uh, indirectly uh, insist uh, with the understanding that it is a donor requirement. And that really requires us to really have a clear dialogue and a direct dialogue with, 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 the, with the donors. Uh, despite all this, we remain focused. And here are the areas where we actually want to, 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 to even take the opportunity of forums and platforms like this to request for more support. We need to continue to standardize the, 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 the HMIS tools and also uh, build more capacity. We also need to complete the integration and interoperability of the, of the systems that are necessary to be used and constantly uh, ensure data quality uh, and information use. And of course, uh, one main focus which we advised uh, in forums like this is with regards to the leadership, uh, coordination, and the governance is very, 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 very key. Uh, definitely, uh, we'll continue to, to require building more capacity, and I could even see in this uh, conference, a lot of new things are still coming, even within the DHIS2. Uh, we have always a, a room to learn. Uh, specifically, with regards to coordination, leadership, and governance, I would want to make sure that we need to agree to coordinate uh, all the donors and the partners and make sure that they align their M&E 
plans with the HMIS and DHIS to implement a roadmap. We have a clear roadmap in the country. Uh, we also need to do resource mapping because we have seen that a lot of resources are being provided through the funding mechanisms, but they end up actually uh, building the capacity of those uh, third party implementers. It is time for us to actually push for building capacity of those that are directly uh, implementing the, 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 the activities, but more importantly, the national systems. That is the only way we can ensure sustainability. There is no way we can achieve sustainable systems if we don't invest in the national systems. We need to strengthen planning and m and &E, uh, structures at all levels. Uh, we are having a decentralized systems, but more importantly, we need to make sure that we integrate not only the, the activities, but we also need to integrate the resources. Uh, there is a lot of duplication. In one facility, you could see there are two or three data offices that are being recruited, deployed by the implementing partners to report to their respective funding mechanisms. And one data person can, can actually do that in a smaller facility. One uh, device can be used to report uh, all the activities of that, of that facility. We also need to monitor and guide the overall HMIS and DHIS implementation process. We also need to introduce performance-based financing. And this is one of the important things we are actually looking at. To be, to be honest, a lot of resources are being spent and, 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 and we are getting less results. So it is time for us to also try to make sure that some aspects of finance, I, I mean of performance-based financing uh, are, are applied and that can also be more motivating to some extent. Uh, what we have learned through this and why we emphasize on the leadership is the fact that the leadership and governance, they go together and they are key. Continuing stakeholder engagement, including a, a, a constant dialogue with, with the donors is, is really key. We need, uh, there is need for sustainable funding uh, without funding, we can't. And especially when we need data and quality data can be actually obtained without uh, investment and a sustainable investment in the data system. We also need to make sure that the ongoing trainings and capacity building are also uh, supported. We need to leverage on the local capacity. Uh, we are happy that uh, on the continent, there are actually health groups and there are also uh, some technical expertise that are actually available in the country it is more efficient to use to use them. Uh, what I wanted to conclude with, and I want to speak to this conference, as a first, uh, a first time participant, I, I, I really uh, learn a lot. I have seen a lot of ideas being shared. And this exactly reminds me of what Bennett Shaw said in this, in this slide. You know, we have every break, we also, we enjoy apples and fruits here. You know, any two of us can grab apples, one each, and if we exchange those apples, each one of us will still have one apple. But when we exchange the ideas, each one of us will have two ideas, and that is actually the beauty of this conference and the beauty of the information system. And please, let's continue building on that. Otherwise, thank you very much. Nice talk with you. Thank you for that lovely talk, Dr. Kendianda. Uh, I will invite all the participants to come and sit up front here, and then we will have um, a bit of a panel discussion facilitated by Sam from um, GFF World Bank. So please have a seat here. We have two microphones, so I suggest Sam get one, and then you just have to be friends and share.
Yeah, this is on. Okay. No, the longer. Oh, they're longer. Okay. Testing. Yeah. Cool. Hi, I'm Sam Johnson Scott. I'm a results and HMIS specialist with the GFF, the Global Financing Facility. And we're a, a partnership of 36 countries housed in the World Bank that uh, focuses very much on RMNCHN. Uh, so uh, women, children, adolescents, uh, health and nutrition. And this panel is, is, this discussion is really, really close to our heart because the whole GFF approach is about country led, about supporting countries to develop an investment case that coordinates what's happening across the RMNCHN sector and also to really make sure that alignment happens, but alignment that's government-led, alignment behind government plans and strategies. So, um, yeah, this panel is very close to our heart. And I wanted, with the questions, uh, perhaps if I could start with you, Dr. Kajende, because you raised some of the difficulties you have with having so many partners working together in country. Um, and one of the things I think would be really interesting to hear is from your perspective, what does a good partner look like? If I were coming to a country for the first time as a partner and I wanted to start a program across, you know, a few different areas, including HMIS, how should I go about that? All right. Uh, thank you, Sam. And uh, before I answer this, a bit of uh, some of my background. I, you, you know South Sudan uh, separated from Sudan. And uh, I happen to have a very unique experience, which I'm sure none of you went through. Uh, I was working in Sudan when South Sudan separated. We became independent, but I continue working in Sudan. And how did that happen? I had to formally transition from being a national to an expatriate in the same country. <laughs> so I had to get my official stay permit. I have to get the, 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 the official uh, work permit. And, and, and I continued to work in yeah. Sudan for quite good three years. So, uh, and I was working for a partner organization. I was working for the Council of Churches, a faith-based organization. And I had the opportunity now to reflect back and see how did I actually uh, interact as a partner. And now I work for the government in my country. And how do I expect the partners to interact? Well, I expect a good partner, Sam, to be a partner that comes to the country, present themselves to the right department in that institution, if it is in the health sector, you go there are always offices responsible for that. Present your letter of intent of what you want to do. And I'm sure you will always be welcome. And there is also an office, and it is the responsibility of the Minister of Health in that example, to direct the partners, to present to the partners what are the priorities, what are the areas of needs. But unfortunately, when I joined South Sudan Minister of Health, the second week, I received a partner because I was actually requested to join the ministry and be in charge of partnerships and, 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 and investment and, and donor investment in health. I received a partner the second week of my job who presented himself and told me that he's coming from one of our states called Northern Barghazal, from a county, from a, a village, from a facility. And he was the one coming to tell me that, you know, they have submitted a, a proposal to EU because a partner so-and-so is exiting in March, and actually he came in November. He's exiting in March, and we are going to take over. And we are going to do one, two, three. So I looked at the guy, I said, okay, thank you very much. So afterwards, he continued staying, I said, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I was also like, I'm surprised. So he said, yeah, is that enough? I said, but what do you want from me? Because you have completed everything. You have even done my job for me. Because I'm here to guide you where the needs are, 
what are the priorities, and should be even me to introduce you to the sub-national level. But you have already reached down up to the village, up to the facility, and you have come back with everything. I believe that would not be the good partnership that we aspire to see. I also want a partner that follows the principles of aid effectiveness. You know, we align with the country's priorities, harmonize with the national structures, and, and we do things together. So I always remind my partners, please, we recognize the fact that we have limited capacity. We can't do this everything alone. But please, as you come to help me, help me to do the job, but that do, don't do it for us. Unfortunately, in many occasions, there's a tendency of taking over. And we are put in the bang, back, back seats. And, and that will not work. We need to be in the driving seat as countries and as governments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Hassan, could I ask you, can we pass the... Oh, you've got one, great. Um, so one of your biggest successes from the sound of it has been integrating some of these disparate systems. So taking health, nutrition, IDSR, and successfully pulling them together into a single integrated system. But we all know that's that sounds a lot easier than it really is. And there are a lot of difficulties persuading programs and partners to, to integrate and to part with it. What advice would you give to another country that, that wants to go down that same path in terms of how to approach this with, uh, with programs and partners? Thank you so much uh, for having me. And, and I'm happy to be part of this uh panel discussion, which we are uh, discuss discussing uh, on, a, on a crucial, important topic, which is the alignment, the harmonization, and integration of investment is going, going to the HMIS uh, sector. And uh, yeah, really, it's a good question, and uh, it has not been easy uh, to um, fulfill or implement an integrated health management information system where you have a lot of partners, donors on the ground. So you, ca you can imagine in one district where you have three partners doing same things and uh, where they want to um, create, develop an information system which collects the same information. So it is very hard. So one of the things is that uh, we have successfully done to achieve integration, what we have achieved so far. And I really see the, the, the presentation from South Sudan, they have a lot of systems which we have already integrated into the DH2, still they have. And one of the things we, done, we have done is, first you, you should have the commitment from the leadership, the, the government, especially the, the Minister of Health, the DG, the Minister, so they have to understand uh, the, 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 the impact and also the, the resources uh, that we are investing into the DH2 and now in, into one single platform. And it's also very important that the program team within the Minister of, or Minister of Health also understands having one integrated information system, the importance of having. So it requires, uh, you know, uh, orientation, it requires, uh, for them also to, as the health management information system section, you have to collaborate and work with the departments with the Minister of Health. If they see that you are working alone, they also work with, with the partners to create multiple systems. So for us, as the, I've been the, the Minister of Health for the last eight years, working the HMI system. So uh, we used to have many systems back uh, three years ago, but uh, we managed to, uh, to, to do integration all of those systems into the one, one platform. One of the things we did, we, we have created, established health and management information system technical working group, which is very, very key. Uh, it's a platform where you can call for all partners uh, to come together. So you can discuss, uh, what uh, what programs are going into the country, the services, and which indicators we would like to monitor. So you should have also, uh, you know, a guiding reference. Uh, otherwise, um, you know, each partner uh, throw 
uh, different uh, many indicators. And you know, the more you put or develop more indicators into your system, the more you have a lot of issue in, into your system. So we have, uh, you know, improved our coordination with within the Minister of Health, as well as with the partners. So it's very key to have one integrated system. And also it is very important you use, you know, the local expertise. Sometimes if you don't have the knowledge to convince your partner to integrate maybe a, a separate system that, the, the, that, the, that they are using, it's also very important to reach out the local expertise. For us, we have also reached out, we worked with uh, Hizb Tanzania, and I remember in one case that uh, we have been trying to integrate uh, integrated disease and violence, E1, into the DH2. So we faced a lot of challenge that to explain how do you accommodate um, IDSR, integrated disease and violence, into the HMIs. So some of the partners, they say, this is not possible. You cannot do it within a single platform. And for us, we have, uh, and we have, we, we also have a strategic document that guides our health sector strategic plan have an objective that outlines to have one integrated system into the country. So to materialize that one, you should have the expertise to, to explain uh, those um, elements. So we've, we've used also positively our local expertise uh, in one of our meetings is that uh, we were discussing the integration of integrated integrate disease and violence into, the, into our health management information system. And we successfully managed it. So we prepared a nice presentation. We presented uh, use cases for different countries, those who have already done the integration. And uh, we also had the commitment from our, lead, our leadership. It's very important. If you don't have the commitment from your leadership, your DG, your minister, you cannot do anything, uh, you cannot do uh, alone. So it's very important you have uh, with this. And also the frequency of the Agile technical working group is very important. So if you are not consistently communicating with the partners through emails, maybe you uh, develop maybe um, a portal where you can uh, provide uh, regular updates to, to the partners, or you convene the, the HS technical working group on quarterly basis, never miss uh, that technical working group. It is very important that they update you also as the minister. What, what, what have your plans with regard to the HMIs? What investments are you going to, to do? So it's very important that uh, you align those resources within this uh, technical working group. Yeah, I think, thank you so much. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. And it's great to hear again, that's that the concept of government led partnerships where you've got the HISP on one hand with the technical expertise, WHO with expertise on IDSR, and the government bringing them together to, to get some sort of leadership and integration there. Um, and really importantly, talking about coordination mechanisms, because I think it, it is probably one of the most critical things in each country is to have that HMIS coordination mechanism. And Maria, I, I wonder if you can grab a mic. Um, obviously, that coordination doesn't just happen at country level. You know, all of the partners that are working in a country are also working regionally, are also working globally. How, in terms of that coordination mechanism, if we look across all three tiers, if we look at country, regional, global, you know, how well do you think that's working? What do you think works well within that? And where do we maybe still need to, you know, improve what we're doing or where are there opportunities to strengthen what we're doing with those coordination mechanisms, specifically around HMIS and ME? Thank you, Sam. So one of the things that we've found, and as we've been hearing throughout today in the examples that we've seen, is that the importance of the country-led mechanisms to bring partners together and align and define priorities. This is where we've seen greater efficiencies, greater alignment. And from my experience, having worked at regional level and also at global level, what I'm seeing tends to happen in some cases is that there are dialogues around partner and alignment and coordination and happening at global level, happening at regional level and happening at countries. And these are all well-intentioned, but they're not intersecting. And so I think this is something critical that we need to really move towards is making sure that these dialogues, that they're happening within the structures in country 
so that they are not organized around when there is a global coordination that's funded by a donor, but it, that it's really aligning around when these internal technical working groups meet around the quarterly basis and that they're really grounded in country. Because, and I think this is speaking to what you had said earlier, Dr. Kadiende, around there are some commitments that are often made, but there's a difference when it comes to the reality and the practice on the ground. And so I really think that we need to make sure that these dialogues are happening in country and not just within the regional level and the global level. So that's something that I would really like to see that we keep working together as, as partners, implementing partners, donors, and with the countries. Great, thank you. Um, Prosper, something that we haven't it's sort of been touched on in the presentations but we haven't talked about as much so far is sustainability. You know, obviously one of the, the risks that comes with partnership is the partnership's time limited. And at the end of that, we have the question of sustainability. Now you're in a unique position where, you know, HISP Uganda has worked with the Ministry of Health for over a decade. So you've got that long-term view. What would you say has worked well in terms of sustainability and what are maybe still the challenges that we need to need to address? Okay, thank you very much. I hope it's very clear. Um, just a caveat, uh, the views that I'm presenting and sharing are the views of all the HISP groups, so <laughs> they are not on the mind. Uh, and, and I'm just speaking on behalf of the, the HISP groups that have been really on the ground um, uh, tackling the issue of sustainability. Yeah, so I have quite a few, and um, and again, my team, my, my colleagues could share. The, the one of the things that we have really seen as the HISP groups is the is the country buying, which everybody has talked about. Uh, and country buying, I am not meaning the buying with money, because if you buy it with money, it's going to, the money will be eaten and it will, it will end. So we, we really need to work around country buying. And, and, and this is something that is quite expensive in terms of time, not money again. Uh, that you have to go over time and, and build. So one of the things that we have tried to do as a his group is to really uh, gain that country buy-in for every implementation that we are talking about. And again, you will see that uh, for most of the countries where the country has really bought into the implementation has really succeeded. I mean, we're talking about so many, 10 years uh, in most of the countries using DHIS2. And... Um, Quite a lot of his groups will just tell you that this has all been because the country owns it. Just imagine you go to the county and say our DHIS too. That's where you want everybody to say our you know logistic system. Our that that alone uh, says a lot. Then uh, the other one is institutionalization. Of course, uh, this also is quite challenging, but really try to build all of whatever you are doing within the institutions, not just you know come and work with a different group, and then when it ends, you just go away. So you really need to understand the institutions that are in place. Uh, the, the doctor talked about the, the different departments, approach the different departments, they lead you to the right team, and you're working together, you are solving their, their problems. The other piece has been capacity building, uh, and capacity building not only in a workshop or conference, but capacity building that goes along with mentorship and support after you have built the capacity. So we've had a lot of trainings over time. Uh, when we look at the DHIS, like for example, training, we have trained uh, almost over 10,000 you know, DHIS to users. Uh, but it's not about training and giving them a certificate, but what happens after the training? If you have had an academy in a region and uh, they go back to the country, there should be somebody to follow up and see what they are, what they have been trained, whether they are putting it to use. And this has been the support of the his groups that they, they are close to the teams, and they are again emphasizing even doing mentorship and coaching. And this, um, in most countries, it's been just you know you go to their offices, work with them, sit with them, be part of their WhatsApp group, be part of their mailing list, and whenever they are asking questions, you know, you have that contact. Uh, continuation. And uh, also the his groups have been really advocating for this capacity building. In most of the trainings, we are calling out partners, please sponsor the ministry uh, to come to this training, to come to this conference. So that works uh, a lot. Then the other one is trusted relationship. Uh, again, this connects to uh, to 
to the counter buy-in, but as a partner, as a person who has been working, do they trust you? Are you representing their views? Can you advocate for them whenever something is coming up? Are you advocating? So that trust is something that also takes quite a lot to build. But once you've gained trust with the government, with the teams, they will be able to get you to the table of where the discussions are, are happening. And then uh, the other piece also is, uh, um, yes, we all have a lot of initiatives, but uh, once you target the real problem, uh, as a partner, if you come in and you're targeting the real problem, the country has identified the problems that they have, and you are just, you know, uh, uh, toward the solving some of the problems, then you are surely going to be able to. Ask. Otherwise, many partners have come and they are solving problems which do not exist. So that obviously is going to be uh, uh, something that is not going to be sustained. Um, Stepwise implementation and, and also trying to understand what is working in place. A lot of people come and just say, ah, the HIS tool was of the past, but what is it currently doing? What is it solving before we try to, you know, bring in something? And how can this be, you know, sort of what the HIS tool is not, is not supporting? And then um, connect with the environment. You know, uh, a lot of us partners, we come with money and you are buying a computer where there's no, where, where there's no, power where there's no human resource. So what is it going to do? We've seen a lot of boxed computers in the health facility in uh, South Sudan, where there's completely no power. Maybe the sun, or would you have gone for solar systems and all that? Now, in terms of the challenges, of course, everybody will talk about uh, funding and funding, but uh, we do believe there is a lot of funding if it's well coordinated. It's uh, the challenge we have is uh, it's not coordinated. It is duplicating, it is paying for things that are not required at the given time. So the, the, that is coined around with coordination. Um, I, I had an opportunity to work with CDC before I, I went to HISP, and we were able to roll out the DHIS to and support the ministry and print out the tools because we coordinated the other partners. We were we went up front and we're coordinating all the other partners, please bring all your indicators, play, print the tools, let's train together and all that. Um, the, the other challenges we're having, and that's, there are so many challenges, but let me just, yeah, the, the, the other challenge of course also connects to the other opportunities, the duplication of efforts is really one of the other challenges that we are having, and that also is with resources and all that. There are quite many, but uh, let me just stop there for the sake of the time. Thank you. No, that's great. I think that shows this is a really, really rich topic, and I think there's a lot there. And that's really good feedback. I just wanted to quickly ask, because as you said, you're representing, you know, speaking for HISPs. Are there any other HISPs in the room that want to add anything to that, that have any additional comments or thoughts to add on sustainability? I'm not sure who might be in the room, but if so, feel free to put your hand up at any time. Um, so one of the things that's come across here again, coordination, governance, and I know, uh, Dr. Kedyende, in your talk, you really emphasize governance as the strongest thing. And you've also talked about framework documents and about, do you want to just maybe talk a tiny bit more specifically about what sort of framework documents um, we have the, about what sort of framework documents you think have been particularly useful and can really help to, you know, to coordinate and align partners around, around HMIS and, and strengthening? Yeah, thank you once again. And and uh, just allow me first also to, to thank uh, Prosper for, you know, all what he has mentioned with regards to the support and the understanding in, in, in our collaboration with the health groups in, in the region. Uh, first of all, uh, it, is, it is a function or a responsibility of the government to, 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 to ensure coordination, provide leadership and governance. And uh, in many occasions, we have structures in place and uh, we have uh, some framework documents. And, 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 and I want to say that alone is never enough. You know, I, I know I'm, I'm not a politician, but I, I know people talk of what is happening in many of our countries. By the way, our countries have, in many countries, we do have very good constitutions. We have very good laws. But the issue is not the law, the constitution alone doesn't make things to move. 
So it's the same thing. One important aspect, and what we have also learned, especially in countries whereby the resources are not made available. You know, if you have the uh, steering committees, you have the technical working groups, we also have the sub working groups, they also need a space, they also need actually to, 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 to interact, they also need to, to, to follow the implementation. But unfortunately, like in the context of South Sudan, the funding mechanisms, and remember I have said that we are 90% dependent on the, on the donors. The funding mechanisms are using third party implementers and those resources are with them. So you can imagine at times you can just be, be, be crippled if the resources are not made available. And that's why I was always telling people, let's try to, to, to invest in the frontline uh, workers. Let's invest in the national systems. In my other comments the other day, I mentioned that, you know, <clears throat> Uh, when you sit on the resources, the power dynamics changes. When we talk of coordination, governance, and leadership, you must have the power of, 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 of making things happen. But unfortunately, if, 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 if a party that sits on the resources is not recognizing that, is not facilitating that, it wouldn't work. And, 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 and that's what I mentioned the other day. Look, uh, those who sit on the resources are perceived to have more powers. So you might make the decision and they might not support, support it. So basically, when we talk of leadership and governance, we really need to have a structure in place whereby the government and all the stakeholders, which includes the implementing uh, agencies, includes also the donor representative, because we have bilateral partners which are actually donor representatives in, in our recipient countries. We also have the, the, the other stakeholders that, that rep represent the beneficiaries, the, the women group, the youth group in some, some setting, uh, civil society voices, you know. But again, uh, what has changed the situation a little bit is when we make sure that the framework documents are reviewed and are updated and clearly state who is responsible for what and what is expected from who. However, we also need collaboration. We need to make sure that we all have a role to play. Thank you. It's about enforcement as well as drafting. And, yeah. That's great. Um, Mr. Hassan, can I, uh, if you pass down the microphone. Yes. Uh, you mentioned, which I thought was really important, that you know, partnerships aren't just external, there's also partnerships within your ministry, partnerships with other programs and you know, partnerships bringing together everyone at all levels and the importance of consultation. But one of the things we know from an HMIS that we're always battling with is trying to balance two of the, uh, two of the sort of themes that you had up there, which is consultation and inclusion and making sure everyone's included on the one hand and prioritization on the other. You know, if everybody comes to the table with all of their needs and everyone's listened to, you can end up with an HMIS that is heavily overburdened with indicators and too. So there's always that tension between consultation and prioritization. And I know you've you've addressed that quite successfully. And what, what would you say are, are good strategies for, for doing that? And, and, and what can help move that discussion forward to make sure not, you know, we don't overload the HMIS? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it's really... Uh, good question, and uh, it's very challenging um, always to bring it together, all partners in one platform, so that you can discuss um, maybe one one subject that yeah, that you want for consensus and agreement to all partners. So it's very very challenging environment. If you don't have, if you are not prepared well for that. Um, and I remember uh, when we were um, conducting the health management information police revision and BH2 revision, um, we were inviting all partners in one platform. We were making sure that no partner were left. Uh, otherwise, you know, uh, countries like Somalia, South, South Sudan, uh, the, the investments are coming from the donors. So if you don't consult, if you don't invite the, the partners, uh, they are also working with other departments within, within your ministry. So it's very important that you coordinate with the program team at the ministry. You invite them. 
uh, to uh, all of them in with 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 within with that uh, consultation meeting. So uh, with that, uh, during the health management information um, consultation meeting, uh, we brought together different partners. Uh, we were reviewing, you know, reproductive maternal child health and a specific program data collection like HIV, TB, uh, and as well as the emergency um, uh, data collection tools. So if you don't make sure that you have all of them in one table, uh, so you lose that uh, momentum and also the integration uh, aspect. And one of the things we did, uh, it's also very important you have, you know, um, a reference documents. So there are a lot of documents that you can reference uh, when you are conducting HMI's tools uh, revision to guide the, the partners. Otherwise, they bring more uh, data indicators into, into the table. And uh, you you will not have a way to uh, you know to convince them if you don't have uh, a reference to 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 guide for them. One of the references we use is uh, you know the uh, analysis and use of health facility data toolkit the WHO developed. There are a lot of uh, comprehensive tools, uh, which is uh, you, you will have a reproductive maternal and child health indicators uh, for the global indicators, the regional indicators, so you can contextualize within your context. And then you have all the indicators, the important indicators, so so do you, do you can keep them to discuss those indicators you have with, within the recommended um, indicators within that document. Otherwise, this will bring a lot of, you know, uh, unnecessary uh, indicators, data elements to bring into your uh, platform. And then will also lead into uh, data quality issue, and the data will not be used, uh, you know, in the future. Uh, this will also lead uh, the duplication of the systems. Uh, one is that uh, the partners also see uh, you are not uh, working on the data quality issue. You are not. Uh, you don't have a reference document. Uh, they will start to question your 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 capacity, your your coordination, and everything. So it's very important that you have those uh, recommended or reference documents within the table while you are consulting with them where with the with the, with the partners and um, and also it is very important that you have uh, a good consultants uh, consultants yeah otherwise when you know when we are doing HMIs tools revision it is a big assignment and uh, sometimes you you hire a firm or a consultant, so it is very very important you look it very fully who you are working with. So if they are not uh, aligning things with the you know um, the global indicators, the recommended indicators, the the tools exist. This will also lead uh, uh, collecting unnecessary things that will lead also. Uh, duplication and vertical for verticalization of the summits within the country. That's one of the ways we we have used to 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 coordinate all those things. Okay, that's great, and I'm sure WHO and UIO will yeah. be very pleased to see the you know facility analysis toolkits being used in such a practical way to to kind of drive these discussions. That's great. <laughs> Pardon me. Just in the last few minutes we've got left, I wonder if there are any questions from the audience for our panel. If we've um. And, and feel free to either address one member of the panel or you can throw your question out to all of the panel members. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Adana from Havtech Solutions Ethiopia. Havtech is a private company, so most of the partnerships that we discuss today is between the government implementing partners and funders. So I believe uh, private, public-private partnership is important to sustain the implementation of DHIS and other digital systems. So I have a couple of questions for uh, the presenters. I want to know how South Sudan and Somalia, uh, and including the health groups, are working with uh, private companies in, in providing uh, Supporting DHR to implementation is one of my questions. And the other question is for the HES group. Are there any defined platform to collaborate with uh, private institutions in providing capacity building training or other supports to our DHS? Thank you. 
Thank you very much for the question. Who who wants to maybe go first? And do you want to yeah. start, son? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, that's a uh, good question. And uh, apart from uh, working with uh, HESP and uh, University of Oslo and other partners on the ground, the technical agents like WHO, UNICEF, and the donors like um, Global Fund, Gavi, GFF, we're also working um, the the local companies. Uh, we are also partnering with the local innovations uh, to uh, also um, be part of the, um, the the innovations we are working, uh, the digital solutions that we are working at, at any level. So an example, uh, nowadays we have uh, a lot of um, digital solutions coming to, to the health facility level. Uh, to turn the data collection tools into into the digital, so we know the DH two have not uh, take to that uh, consideration uh, with the aspect of uh, fully fledged electronic medical record. So there are a lot of innovations. Though. So we are partners with the local government, local uh, companies, uh, to also work on the digital solutions. Uh, which which can also interoperable can be linked to the to the DH2, so we are also encouraging the the local uh, companies and also other private companies to come in and also work with uh, what we have already doing with the, within the, within the HMIs. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for your question. With regards to South Sudan, uh, there are two things. Uh, currently, uh, we still have limited number of uh, private, uh, you know, uh, institutions with the necessary capacity that they can, they can, they can actually do this. However, we also do recognize that there are existing companies that provide some other digital solutions in the country, but not necessarily uh, the DHIS too. Uh, we are currently being supported by his uh, group, his Tanzania, and uh, the support also includes building the capacity. And I can actually give an example. When we digitalize the L Alliance uh, distribution and we produce the report and it was actually excellent, uh, the, the apps that we use, the apps that we use to, 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 to do it uh, through the DHIS2, was actually developed by one of our own our own staff members, and 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 it came after a serious debate because uh, there is always a, a narrative, especially about South Sudan, which unfortunately in many occasions is is, is not true. Uh, there's a lot of negative narrative. So when we had the DHIS to, I mean, when the the, the digital reporting on the L Alliance distribution, it came as a condition by the donor. And there were a lot of options put on the table. Some were actually being sent from, from different parts of the world. We know there's a lot of networking that, that, that happens, whether it is in Geneva or it is in New York or Washington or whatever. So they are always being sent to us in South Sudan. And they come with the narrative that we, we don't have the capacity to do this and that. And to make it worse, when we also say that we want to use the DHIS2 for this, we were being told everywhere that we you cannot make it. Uh, and DHIS2 was not designed to do this. Uh, it was tried in this place and that place, and it has never worked. And one good thing, and, and, I, and I think what uh, I, I, I concur with what Somalia said earlier, strong leadership matters. I remember our minister, once when, when she got convinced that we will be doing this, because we're also conscious with regards to the data. You know, the moment that you outsource it, the data goes somewhere else and you will not get it. You will definitely become dependent and the subsequent activities will still go back to them. And that was the main reason we said, and I insisted, by then I was still in charge of policy planning and research and monitoring and evaluation. We convinced our minister that we can do this. So when even our implementing partners and, and the donor reached the minister, said, look, DHIS2 cannot do this. It was tried in this country, in this country, our minister was able to say, no, please remember that South Sudan is not other country, it's not any other country. 
is South Sudan. Have you tried in South Sudan? They said, no, then please allow us to do it. And if it fails, uh, come and hold us accountable. And that became a bigger motivation for us, although it was a challenge. So one of our developers was able to develop the app and with support from East Tanzania, we were able to, 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 to achieve it. We were able to discover new things. You know, when we also used to do the geo coordinate in some locations that are close to the border, we ended up seeing, you know, in the map, falling even in the ocean, in Latin America. So when we sought it, the, as the, the support even from the DHIS to centrally here, we are actually reassured that has nothing to do with you people. <laughs> so please, we will advise and we'll find the solution for that. So I want to say, uh, we are also mindful of using the local capacity whenever it is possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think we've only got a, a minute or two left, but if you can okay, quickly give that just quickly, perspective, uh, that would be great. Uh, and, I, and I think uh, for for the his groups, I think uh, one of the challenges that uh, we have had is we're not working in like, you know, so much for profit. Uh, we first think about the solution before we think about the money. So uh, there has been a lot of openness in trying to get everybody to align with the HIS2 and work with the HIS2. So you have um, uh, the academies are open to everybody. It's not that it is meant for the government. So uh, the private sector is invited to participate in these regional academies. We try to rotate them to be able to accommodate that. We have the community of practice where People are getting free access and service to whatever solution they are having in trying to connect with the HIS to and trying to consume or, or exchange data with the HIS. So there is quite a lot that uh, is happening in terms of getting the private sector in in the in the, in, in, in the DHIS to space. The only challenge we face is that you come with huge, huge costs that make it very expensive and makes the DHIS to look really like it is very expensive to implement and 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 connect to. Well, thank you very, very much to the whole panel. I've, if everyone could just give the panel a huge round of applause. And I think for a lot of really great shared experience, it really comes back to your slide, doesn't it? We've just swapped a whole lot of ideas and everybody's gained. So thank you very, very much to everybody and to the audience as well. Thank you. Yeah.